Savior, our high priest, we're believing that the covenant will be opened up to you and I because of the faith that comes forth from our heart and our mouth. And he put the faith there to do that. Father God, we thank you today. We worship you. We give unto you our tithes, our offers, our first fruits, and our everything. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you that you died and rose again for us. We honor you and worship you with our resources because you gave them to us. We thank you for the hundredfold return and the supernatural increase, Father, for this season. And Father, we're believing beyond what we've ever believed before that you supernaturally will cause the increase. And we will be quick to give you the credit and the glory. In Jesus Christ. Holy name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, the, the little kids can, can go to their class, and the big kids can get down closer. You know, if, if this is, I just looked at something in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Last night, we always leave our window open, and our Arizona room is the top of the, the, is right outside the window, just six inches down from the window. And since I put that new metal roof on our house, man, it's so nice when it rains. And, uh, and so it rained all night, it seemed like last night. It has for several different nights, not in a row, but just rain, it just sounds so good. The title of this is The Sound of an Abundance of Rain. And, and we'll get into that in just a minute, but we all here believe the Bible, don't we? Don't we believe it's a covenant, cutting the blood of Jesus, that it's sealed, it's a finished work, and that we access it by faith? Is that true? You ought to be a little bit more excited about it, but, uh, but I'm a person of excitement. My wife had to dress me down this morning, not dress me up, dress me down. She said, everybody's just not the same as you are. And I said, well, I've become, after nearly 40 years of pastor, and realize that. But I, I just can't understand why people are passionate and excited about this covenant. Because no matter what economic level you was born into, no matter what race you are, no matter where you've been and come from, God puts you on an even playing field by faith, and you have a covenant so long as you've accepted Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Amen. So you can quit blaming someone or something. Just look at yourself and say, you're the one that didn't get in the covenant. You need to get in the covenant. You need to get here because it's waiting for you. Your future is waiting for you. Your desires are waiting to be fulfilled by your God. But you need to get into this book and begin to learn what God says. And not what you imagine or what somebody you heard 10 years ago say. But get in for a current revelation experience with God. And I want to ask you, the reason I ask you this question is because there is an abundance of rain that's been spoken of, and it's coming upon the earth. So I want to encourage you today, <clears throat> if you all, I'd like to have a little bit more, appease me, a little bit more excitement. Do you all believe that this book is the Word of God? Yes! It says, Holy Bible, right here on it. Okay, then I'm going to read something that belongs to you. Okay, I'm going to read something that belongs to you, a covenant right that from this moment forward you can expect to happen in your life if you'll believe it and, and act in faith. You say, does it come the minute you pray? Inside of you, when you stand for and believe you receive, by faith, it's supernatural, it's of the realm of the unseen, and then you shall have it as you walk out and give praise to God, eventually it manifests. And it says this, and this wasn't even part of my scripture, I mean my message today, but I'm giving it to you anyway. 
Now thanks be to God who always, everybody says always, always. causes me, causes me. Poke yourself, wake yourself up, causes me, causes me. to triumph, triumph in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. Well, if he always causes you to triumph, what's the problem? Nothing. Nothing. Except you and me. Except you and me. If there is a problem, it's because we have either been taught wrong, we received wrong, we haven't got a revelation yet of what God's doing, or we need to spend and sit in His presence and let His Spirit just soak in His Spirit, soak in the Word, and begin to get a revelation. If God always causes us to triumph, then we need to be on a triumphant road and begin to declare our victory before we ever sit with our natural eye. Amen? Amen? So, I titled this as I was thinking about some of the hardships I've gone through in life. And the hardships are put there by the enemy. Not God. God's there in the hardship. Who put the, uh, the Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fire furnace? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. He, he put them in there. Why did he put them in there? Because he wanted them to look at him as a god and to worship him. And they said, oh, oh, king, you can do anything you want to to us. But we know our god. We're not going to bow our knee to you. If you kill us, now this is an attitude we need to get in the church. Yeah. If you kill us, oh, king, you kill us. But... We believe our God will deliver us and set us free. Amen. His strongest men, Whammo, walked up. He, it made him so mad, these little young, freckle-faced boys, empowered by the Spirit of the living God, looked them and, and, and right in his face renounced his superiority over them as a God. And he made him so mad, he said, heat the furnace up seven times over. And when they did, the, his strongest soldiers, when they went up to put the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, in that place, that furnace to destroy all of mankind, it killed the very men that put them in. Be careful, enemy, because when you come against the children of the living God that know their rights, Know their covenant. Be careful because they're a supernatural power that will protect them and set us free and keep us going on the path of victory in Jesus' name. And on top of that, when they rolled up and they threw them in there and they looked up, the fourth man was already in the furnace. And he said he took on the appearance of Jesus Christ himself. And what did it do? What meant to kill them burnt the, the bands and the ropes off of them and freed them to stand up and talk and give praise to God with Jesus standing in the midst of the fire and it could not hurt them, would not hurt them. They were always called to succeed through Christ Jesus. Amen. That's not an allegory. That's not some kind of fable. That is a true statement and a true word and a true account. It's not something, don't listen to somebody who tries to tell you that the Bible is just some kind of fairy tale. It's too late for me. We've experienced too much. Knowing that there is abundance of rain coming. In 1 Kings 18, it says, It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. In the third year, saying, Go show yourself unto Ahab. Hadn't rained in a long time. And I will send rain upon the earth. Verse 2. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. It hadn't rained. It was dry, dusty. No rain come. And he's telling Elijah to go tell the king, Rain's coming. Verse 41 says, and Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. Let me tell you something. Yeah, it's been dry a long time. 
Yeah, we might have been off course and maybe operating below where we should be operating. But let me tell you something. I hear an abundance of rain coming. I hear an anointing coming. I hear a revival coming. I hear an abundance coming on the church that we've never seen before. And I don't care if it's been dry for 40 years, three and a half years, and no rains come to the church. Let me tell you, your pastor hears an abundance of rain coming. We're being set free so that we can be those that go out and set other men and women free because of the anointing of the living God. I hear Hear the rain. But for you to hear the rain, you've got to have ears to hear. He said, there's a sound of an abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, put his face between his knees. <laughs> it's still pretty dusty, guys. And said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing, Master. And he said, Go again seven times. We don't want to give up and quit expecting. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there arise a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand and he said go up and say unto Ahab prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not he said not only are we going to get a little rain it's going to be a flood and it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah, and he girded his loins, and he ran before Ahab. It was 18 miles to get to where Ahab was going. And God anointed Elijah. He girded his loins up. He ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. He beat the king in his chariot on foot. Didn't that make you, I mean, man, alive. Elijah had a vision after three and a half years of drought. Elijah's vision called for an abundance of rain, but it still hadn't even formed a cloud in the sky. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Faith, you have to speak faith when there is no way, no possibility. There's no clouds anywhere. There's no beginning. It doesn't look like there's any possible way for you to walk in the place that God's called you to walk. But by faith, you begin to declare. Amen. That vision was given to him directly from God. Now, the interesting thing is that immediately after God spoke to Elijah, the Bible states... That there was sore famine in the land. Right after God spoke, it was so dry and dusty, you couldn't even breathe hardly. God steps into famine and promises a flood. God steps into an impossible situation, Chuck. Before you ever see a change, and he says, I'm going to deliver you from this situation. Trust me. In fact, in those times, in the bleakest of times, is when God promises you victory every time. In fact, in those times that God chooses to work the most often, Because when God brings flood out of drought, feast out of famine, everyone around knows it's God. Remember Gideon in Judges 7, verse 2, talks about the people that are with thee are too many. I noticed we had a little thinning out ourselves. But he's coming back. 
He said, the people with you, Gideon, you got too many soldiers. For me to give many, uh, the Midianites into your hand. Lest Israel, Israel would vault themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. He knew how Israel operated. He knew it didn't take much for them to fall off track. He said, if I let you go out with ten or 20,000 soldiers and you win, they're going to begin to say, look what we did. Amen. That's right. That kind of reminds me of that Harbinger report from Rabbi Khan from Ground Zero. Coming right out of Isaiah 58, I believe it was, where they begin to talk about how they will restore in the Old Testament. We will restore. What? Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9. Isaiah, 9. Isaiah 58 says. I'm fasting. Yeah, fasting. Well, maybe more fasting. Amen. Isaiah 9. 8 and 9. When we begin to understand that when we give God all the credit, the abundance of rain, and He speaks to us, it's out of our hands in the natural, but it's within us supernaturally. It's not easy to walk by faith. Amen. You can't accomplish it in the natural, but you've got to go to God and let God instill His strength in you so that you'll hold steady as you walk out the victory. <coughs> Jairus' daughter was another account in the New Testament <clears throat> about Jesus is walking around, people getting healed, things happening, and Jairus' daughter's laying home dying. The same thing with Martha and Mary's brother Lazarus. He's over there tending to the father's business. And they're upset with him because he didn't come, and their Lazarus laying dead four days begin to stink. All past Jewish law, they should have buried him. <clears throat> he said, just give me a little time, I'll get there. It doesn't make any difference if the situation is stinking and you've been dead so long, or they just died, or your promise just died, or it's been dead 50 years. God said, I'll raise it up and I'll make it work right now in Jesus' name. Amen. But the problem is, is us keeping our faith and believing and trusting in God and not ca <clears throat> casting away our confidence. Amen? Amen. I'll speak. So, God delights to what miracles in your life. Amen. Especially where a man can't work. Where a man can't succeed, you're up against the wall. Uh, we, we heard a friend of ours talking about he didn't know what to do. He'd always been able to take care of everything. But you come to a point sometime in life that if you're fortunate, that you can't handle it. And you're going to have to have a God that's bigger than you to do it. Really, that's the best place you could ever be. <clears throat> God delights in bringing answers to situations that stump men. That's right. Doesn't he? Yep. I mean, I can think of it all through the Bible. God delights in doing what man can't... Well, actually, we say it can't be done. That can't be done. It, the Red Sea couldn't be parted. Amen. A bunch of... Those Egyptian soldiers should have paid attention and not went in. Because it only parts for the children of Israel, not for the enemy. Right. <clears throat> God's talking about, I will not share my glory. He, we are the instruments that should bring him glory through our exploits that he gives us. Through our endeavors, through the power and presence of Almighty God to bring about impossible situations through the power of God. Matthew 19, 26 says, <clears throat> But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible. 
But with God, all things are possible. Amen. You know what? I wrote down here, interestingly enough, many times that God speaks increase in multiplication to us is in a time that we're in one of the most lost or barren places in our life. Think about it. This is where faith comes in at, is when we're past our natural ability. I've said many times, faith is the only vehicle, it's supernatural, that can take you beyond your natural limitations. This is where the promises of God will be tested the most in our lives. I personally wish the test didn't come. But the Word of God talks about in Luke and in Mark, He talks about the sower sows the Word and immediately Satan comes to pull it out of your heart or to test that Word to see if you're going to walk by faith or kick it off down the street. Is that not true? But who is the tester in that regard? Satan. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> God spoke to Abram and gave him a great promise between Bethel and Ai, and then immediately there was a famine. Look at Joseph. Many preachers have preached on Joseph. He was given a dream by God and then immediately thrown into a pit and sold into slavery. Be careful what you dream. <laughs> I was talking to Sid Hall in England this morning coming to church. And I said, as far as I know, with Joseph, his brothers wanted to kill him and his older brother saved his life so just throw him in the pit and sell him. Got thrown in the prison. Accused false. Some of us might be able to learn to quit blaming others and just stand up and say, my God delivers me. I don't ever recall an instant recorded in the Bible that Joseph ever spoke one bad word about his God. David was anointed king of Israel and then said, Sonny, go back up to the pasture and keep the sheep. The king sent him back. I mean, he was anointed. Samuel anointed, then sent him back to the field to tend the sheep. There's a tendency in the earth today to say, who do they think they are? I'm not going to go tend them sheep anymore. You follow the course God has laid out, and then we will walk into victory eventually to fulfill our dreams and our purposes God has called us to be and do. The widow woman was promised increase by Elijah when she was preparing to die. He said, what are you doing, woman? Said, I'm out here together with a few sticks. I'm going to make our last meal. Man, my son's going to lay down and die. He said, oh, wait a minute. The man of God just came in. Would you pay attention to what I'm saying? Would you pay attention to what I'm saying? You walk by faith and not by sight. The tester and your enemy is Satan, not God. Your God is a deliverer. And let me, let me give you something. If your theology is screwed up, probably some of it is. My associate, tall, red-headed boy, he's going on to be at the Lord today. His number one scripture in the Bible for determining anything was John 10.10. 10. Satan comes to steal to kill and destroy. I have come, Jesus said, to give you life and life more abundantly. Isn't that, whether you understand it or not, a pretty good dividing line? And over in the book of James, it says, God, it is impossible for God to tempt or test you with evil. 
Well, anything that's trying to kill you, destroy you, or bring you down is evil. And none of it's in God. So when we begin to understand the widow woman walking around, and here comes the man of God. CNN would have loved to have been there. And they wouldn't have recorded the miracle. They would have just recorded the man of God took the widow woman's last meal. The man of God stole the last bit of oil and meal from the widow woman. There is an enemy out there to try to rob you of your faith. He said, stop what you're doing and make me a cake. Make me a meal. She said, well, I ain't got nothing to lose. Man of God, I'm going to make you a meal. And for the next three and a half years, her barrel never run dry till it rained and she got crops going again and she was fed. God fed her for the next three and a half years out of one simple step of obedience and believing what the man of God said. God promised that he would bring a living, breathing army back to life. When Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37 was staring at a valley of dry bones. He even had Ezekiel prophesy over the bones. He wouldn't even do it. He said, well, what do you think, Ezekiel? You speak to the bones. And he's saying to you, David, to you, to you, do all the rest of you today. What do you think will happen in the situation you're facing? What about that relationship? What about that financial situation? What about the physical situation? What do you think, Jim? I think I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ. I think that everything I go after, I'm going to prosper through Jesus Christ because He said, I'm going to cause you to triumph in everything that you do. I believe that the Spirit of the living God that quickens Jesus from the dead quickens my body. I believe that I have the mind of Christ and wisdom flows through me because of the Word of God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of the living God. I believe I'm a child of God, so I'm led by the Spirit of God. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? We need it. What, what do you say? What do you say? And what did he do? He began to prophesy over the dry bones. And he said they began to get flesh on them. And then their tendons began to grow back. And I, I, boy, don't you think it? Uh, you talk about the zombie movement? <laughs> if there had been a bunch of them young people standing around, they'd have went back and said, you ought to see what that old man did. He, he began to prophesy, and we watched with our own eyes, dry bones, so white you couldn't even tell what they were, and, and all of a sudden we saw with our own eyes skin and muscle begin to grow, and then all of a sudden tendons to be attached, and then all of a sudden they blew, God blew breath into them. God blew the Spirit of the living God, the breath, and they began to walk. You do your part, and God always does His part. Amen? Amen? Why didn't he just save them at the beginning? I don't know. But he raised them up. And he didn't do it alone. You know, the last page I added in the second printing of my little book. Why would you do anything without God? Because God will do nothing without you. He could have raised all them dry bones up, but no, he wanted to use his man. He wanted to flow through the man. He could have caused the barrel to flourish of the widow woman and save her, but he wanted to use the prophet of God to give the opportunity to the woman to walk in obedience to what God had said. Jesus was baptized to fulfill every bit of the law and then immediately led into the wilderness. The 
issue is, will you believe God over a wilderness experience or you, will you blame him? Jesus walked without sin and without bowing to temptation for 40 days and he came out victorious and it said Satan was the tempter, not God. Amen. Amen. It's easy to trust God when you're in the feast time. But can you trust Him when you hit a little famine? It's easy to trust God when our economy is over the top. And houses are bringing $15,000 a foot and you're buying and selling. Can you trust him when one of them houses you paid fifteen thousand a foot for goes to forty dollars? It's difficult, but it's possible by faith. It's easy to trust God for a great revival when the music's playing and the pews are full. People hopping around and carrying on. But can I still trust him when people are leaving and talking ugly about you? You see, everything's relative to your belief. The greatest test of our faith comes when we begin to get a hold of the word and our covenant rights, and we begin to make declarations, and we begin to say, that preacher down there said, if I believe all things are possible, and all of a sudden you begin to make declarations that everything I put my hand to prospers, and everything that I do, God's on my side, He's giving the desires of my heart, and all of a sudden you fall flat on your face, and everything crumbles around you. Then's when you get back up to the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and say, that's not God, I've got an enemy, I'm going to find out where I open or crack the door in my thought life of what I'm doing, and I'm standing strong, and my God said he'll put me over, and I'm walking to victory right now. I ain't ever quitting, devil, you might as well stop now, because I'm resisting you in the power and presence of the name of Jesus and the blood of the Lamb. I'll never quit. I don't care where we're at. I don't care what. I can remember when the devil wants you to quit. He'll bring things again. I can still remember the day that doctor come out and told me my 15-year-old son was dead. I, I was the strongest faith preacher. Brother Copeland and Hagen had never been south of Orlando. We was down in the West Palm Beach area. We was breaking new ground and tall in the soil with the Word of God and hundreds and hundreds of people getting healed and set free. And I'm sitting in Mayo Clinic and they say, your son is dead. And then the next day is a wife that said, you're crazy. You shouldn't have done it. Yeah, I'm leaving you after 25 years. You're done. And then the board say, you've made some major mistake, so you're out of here. Let me say something. Whenever the enemy comes into you to stop you, it is the enemy, not God. It is the enemy that wants to rob you of your joy and your peace. But most of all, what he wants to rob is your call and what God's put on your life to make a difference with hurting and dying people and make you change your message and make you change and pacify people by saying, well, maybe God has another plan for it. God had a plan for my son. He should still be living. God had a plan, and it should be working. But somewhere we opened the door, an opportunity to let Satan in through something that we either we didn't know or we refused to believe or we wouldn't walk there or we were too prideful to say, Lord, forgive me. I'll turn the corner and I'll go another way. Let me tell you something. It's a dangerous area for you to know to do good and you not do it. Yeah. 
So what we do is we have to come back to the Word of God. We've got to take a stand. And you've got to, and whenever the enemy comes in to stop you and to rob the Word, you've got to be determined through the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit that you're going to be stronger than you've ever been. That you're going to walk higher than you've ever walked. And it's going to be God that does it in and through you. And you're going to help more people than you've ever helped. And you're going to see revival hit the land of the United States of America. And I believe it's starting right now. I hear an abundance of rain. I hear the revival of God coming. I hear the things that are, and it's going to happen right here. We're not going to drive to Phoenix to get in a Benny Hinn meeting. We're not going to drive to, we're going to draw in the presence of the living God, and it's starting right here in our lives. We serve the same living God. We have a God that is so willing. He wants to bring a demonstration that we're the children of the living God. That Satan's been defeated. And by faith we can rise up and do whatever he's called us to do and be because he's with us every inch of the way. So what do we do? Sometimes in Psalms it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless he come again with rejoicing, bringing the sheaves with him. Sometimes when we can't see it, we think it'll never happen. That's why you've got to have the eye of faith. That's why this book has to be number one in your life. And when you hear the word, it builds faith inside. That's why you've got to get an understanding of who God is and who you are with God. We think that God has forgotten His Word sometimes when we get in doubt. And it's promised. But that's where faith has to come in. When it looks impossible, trust in the living God and the Word by faith. See, I get excited. God's promises you know, Pentecostals, I come from a Pentecostal background. And uh, one of our thoughts were, God's going to do it. If you're working in a business in a company, and you think Clark's going to do it, and he's going to do it in your stead, something ain't going to get done. God has made provision for you and I to do it. If God was going to do it, He would have done it. He would have done it with Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. If if God was going to do it, He would have took the widow woman's mill and increased it without a man praying or taking a step of faith. If God was going to do it, He would have. Just had Lazarus raised and come out of the grave when Martha and Mary got upset. If God was going to do it, you know, he would have so many things. He wouldn't have ever had Joseph throw in the pit. He just translated him right over to his uh, to save the children of Israel. We must understand for God to seem like he's doing it, it takes faith to acknowledge and to bring about the power that's in the Word of God that makes it creative and makes it come alive. And yeah, it seems like God just come on the scene. God came on the scene 2,000 years ago. God has never got off the throne. God said him right there. Jesus said at the right hand of the Father, the Word of God is alive, and we activate it by faith. Why did Jesus just go up there and kick the grave with Lazarus in and just let his presence bring him alive? No. He had to excel and he had to produce faith and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Body, respond to healing. Children, get on board. What I'm saying is this. We're no better than Jesus. If Jesus needed to make a declaration of faith and declare it before it happened, then we do too. Amen. We need to understand. Hebrews 11, 1, faith means 
being sure of the things we hope for, knowing that something is real even if we do not see it. Faith is simply disregarding my current circumstances or saying, look, I was going to preach my little message on faith, fact, and fiction. And God gave me this. Your faith is based on supernatural truth of the Bible. Fact is based on, yeah, Catherine and Jim are fighting cancer. They're fighting things with their health. That, that's a natural fact. The fiction comes out of John 8 and 44. Satan's a liar. He's the father of all lies. And the lie is they're too old or too far gone. The truth is my God died for him. My God, by his stripes, he is healed. He has a covenant right. Now he needs to hear more than ever before. Jim, you're healed. Amen. Catherine, the creed of miracles is taking place in your hill. You say, well, what if it doesn't happen? What if it does? Amen. And I think it's a lot better because I've been in them hospitals. For somebody to come by and say, Jim, you got a covenant right today. It isn't hopeless. You're not going to die in this place. God's raised you up. I declare right now the power and presence of the creative working power that's invested in the blood of Jesus Christ. I declare you well and healed. Okay, Pastor. I'm believing with you. So you've got to get past what you hear and see with your natural because it will try to rob you of your faith. It's disregarding, it's saying, look, yes, that is a natural fact. Yeah, I know our bank account's empty. That's a natural fact. Yes, I know the kids run off and, and doing everything which way. That's a natural fact. But my God said, Amen. all things are possible to the man or woman who can believe. Amen. Can't we get more right? Can't we believe for every day we walk and every breath we take that we're believing for supernatural impact of God? Amen. Abraham in Romans 4, verse 19, being not weak in faith. Everybody say, I'm not weak in faith. I'm not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead. When he was about 100 years old, Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Faith is simply not giving up on the promise of God. It's believing. It's working. You're in the time. You planted the seed with your mouth, your belief. And in the time, it's manifesting. It's growing. You're seeing a manifestation about to take place. And it's coming about in Jesus' name. Even if it takes three and a half years, like it did for the promise for the rain to come. Joseph's case was 13 years before he walked into the provision and the actual will of God for his life. But the journey took 13 years. Abraham's case was 25 years. Faith is simply realizing that I may not see it. I may not feel it. I can't touch it yet. But God said it and I believe it. If you take this truth and begin to walk in it, you'll be a rare commodity in the body of Christ. <clears throat> and not only do I believe it, but I'll act on it even when others think I'm crazy. I see an abundance of rain falling on this congregation. Amen. Because God said it. I'll do it in Jesus' name. Elijah's vision called for an abundance of rain. Not a sprinkle, not even any dew, not a quick shower, but an abundance of rain. 
Immediately after the vision was given, the servant saw nothing. Let's look at three things that I believe we can learn from. There had been a drought for three and a half years. The first obstacle that the man of God had to overcome was to instill faith in his servant that he'd keep going looking, believing that he's going to see a cloud. Yeah. And everyone else around him, because the history showed there's no rain, they forgot what rain looked like. What he has to overcome is words like this. It's not rained in years. What makes you think it's going to rain now? You know, your kids always been like that. What makes you think God's going to deliver them now? This is the way it's always been. Our family's always been like this. It's not rained in years. And, you know, what makes you think it's going to change now? You know, we've even got accustomed to famine. We've even got accustomed to living in a socialized system. We've got accustomed to living in a welfare system that barely keeps us alive and robs us of everything that we should be believing God for. The way it's always been is the way it's going to be. I hear those words myself. I want you to remember Abraham was old well into his life, he was 100 years old and the Lord blessed Abraham in all things but it wasn't without releasing faith in his worship it says in Romans 4 that he was empowered and strengthened as he gave worship and praise to God. When something goes wrong with you, do you give praise to God, thank him for setting you free, or do you scold God? Why did you let this happen? You see, Remember some time ago? I don't know how I'd missed it all those years. And it talks about Genesis 25. The blessing of God on Abraham was so strong. Remember we read earlier in Romans 4 that when God spoke to him, he said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. He is almost 100. Sarah was 90. But he said he didn't falter in unbelief because of how old he was in the deadness of Sarah's womb, he just believed God. Where there was no natural hope, he continued to have hope in God. A supernatural faith. Amen. And then it amazed me how far and how many generations your blessings can go. In Genesis 25, he outlived Sarah, and that is a really an unusual thing, guys, for your wife to outlive you. I mean, for you, you know, actually the wives always outlive the husbands. Now. And in Genesis 25, he married a woman called Keturah. Again, Sarah had died. He outlived even his wife. 
And it had to be 25 or 30 years down the road. I don't know how many, but he was already 100. He, he wasn't doing that well, and God had to do a resurrection life in him. And it said, this new wife, after Sarah died, gave him six more sons. Are we operating far below? <laughs> I'm not telling you a hundred you need six more sons, but what I am is <laughs> If this man could believe, first of all, his faith was accredited to him for righteousness before Jesus ever got to the cross. His faith sustained him to believe God that he would be the father of many nations with Isaac. He got past horrible mistakes with the handmaiden and having a child of the flesh. God still blessed him beyond and then he gave him another wife after his first wife died and they had six more sons. It's unreal to me. But we need to have the reality of this strike us that we are connected and serving and walking with the supernatural God that all things are possible with. <clears throat> Abraham said, hey, I know I'm old, but I was old back then and God blessed me with a son. And if he did it then, he can do it again and again and again and again and again. Why give up on the blessing of God? What's the curse of history in your life is broken? What's that curse of everybody telling you it can't be done is broken? Then you will experience the abundance of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Even after the promise came to the man of God, he had to send his Serve out. I mean, he's sent him six times. And a young guy, man, a man needs like this. Probably today's you. Man, that, what did I say? That ain't no cloud, man. You keep sending me out. And he said, son, just go one more time. And the young man come back and said, yeah. Don't begrudge small beginnings. Can you give me a little volume again? I won't step up that close. Do you understand? It doesn't make any difference if it's the sixth time or the sixtieth time. As long as you keep walking with God, keep trusting His Word and His covenant on your behalf, and you walk by faith and not by sight, you will see the provision of God. Whenever everything looks bad, this is when it's hard to believe. You've been in a drought. Some guy comes along and starts preaching faith to you. Get a little glimpse of glory. Preacher comes and preaches a message that builds your faith and says, Things don't have to be like they've been. They don't always have to be there. Rain's on the way. You get up the next day full of faith, full of expectation in the morning. Going rushing, looking out the kitchen window to witness the deluge that's coming. There you see it again. 
just like every day for the last year and a half years. Cloudless skies. No reason in the natural to believe. Everything seeming like it's still the same as it was. Your faith is kind of robbed. Your hopes are so high, and then you had somebody come by and tell you, now don't get your hopes up too high. The Bible says, after the promise, there was a sore famine in the land. Sometimes the enemy just wants to see who you are and what you believe. Today, I believe something is happening. I think I see something that I've never seen here. It's not all that big, it's pretty small, but let me tell you, it's about the size of a man's hand. You see, I'm stepping out on faith again. Where others see smallness, I see abundance you see when the clouds so small, so small it was like in, of the hand of a man it excited Elijah oh man so much that he said it's abundance it's here and it was only the cloud was the size of a man's fist Others around saw nothing but smallness. Elijah looked at a small thing and saw abundance. That's what faith does. You see, the difference between us and others is that we deliver and encourage faith every time we get together. Sometimes we have a hard time looking at tiny things and thinking of abundance. But small things quickly become big things when God's in the middle of it. Zechariah 4.10, for who, for who hath despised a day of small things? God promised Abraham's seed is the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky, but he started with one baby boy. Jesus fed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves. He created the vast universe in six days, and he started on the first day. He just separated the night from the day. That's all he did. Out of nothingness. Out of nothingness. Things that look small through the eyes of natural become huge when you look through the eyes of the Spirit. I wonder if today in this place is starting to hear if anyone is starting to hear what I'm hearing is there anyone who will go just one more time to the horizon and look for the promise of God I know you've been there six times with me already but this time's different. I am hearing the sound of the abundance of rain. I am hearing the sound of Almighty God saying, I am moving 
upon the face of the earth like never before. Don't look around you and think we're small. We actually line up exactly in perfect perspective before God's eyes so that He can get a lot of glory for the White Mountains, Arizona, and this nation to be turned upside down by a small group of willing army, God-called army, being equipped to walk by faith and not by sight. It's your opportunity. The choice is yours. You can either keep milling around in your mess and eat your slop with the hogs, or you can cry out to a father that's expecting you to come home. And he'll feed you and have a feast. And he'll make you and he'll elevate you because you called on him and you walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. I hear an abundance of the anointing of God. I hear the very things that God has called us to do and be. I hear that you at the Living Church are hearing the provision of God, the Word of God, the faith of God to stand up and make a difference at this time. This is our day. The early church, you know, it was the disciples' day. You know, you had James, you had Peter, you had John. Now, we got Vince, and Duke, and David, and, you know, Bruce, and Tyler, Brother Greg, Chuck, Marty, Brother Bill, Jim, Nadine, and the Spirit of God saying, it's time to walk by faith. Expect the abundance of rain. Don't just live your life like normal. Live it with an expectant mind and heart to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of the living God to bring change to humanity in Jesus' name. We'll give him some praise. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone in this room that would say, I hear the abundance of rain? Yeah. Father God, keep your hand up. I release the anointing of the living God that you raise up. Even in small things, when you're here, and your abundance is so strong that the anointing will flow and we will hear your voice like never before, and we will be quick to obey. Father God, I thank you that the abundance of rain has started, and awakening has come, and you will from this day forward get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, praise him a little bit. God's good. That's our communion. Saturate you and bring you to a new place with him. 